With Hashem's loving grace, we are going to learn tonight in preparation of Shavuot, the Megillah of Ruth, the Megillah of Ruth, and the secrets of Mashiach, because the secrets of Mashiach, the suit on the way, they all come down in the Megillah, and we're going to take a good look at them. All right, now I'm going to begin with a parable that I made up in my head, okay? And maybe when you hear this, you're going to think that the laser fell on his head. Okay, but let me tell you my parable and, and see what you think of it, okay? Uh, the first thing is true. The head of the Hamas in Gaza, his name is Yechia Sinwar. The old head of Gaza, which was uh, Ismail Hania. Ismail Hania, he sadly went to some Arab country because I think he, th he was afraid that uh, the Israelis would get their hands on him. But now Yechia Sinwar, he's the head of the Hamas. He hates Israel with the worst passion because he was a convicted terrorist with blood on his hands. He sat in prison for several years and he was given back at some prison exchange. When one of the big prison exchange, I think it was when the Gilad Shalit came back. Okay, now just imagine that Yechia Sinwar, that every day you can see, if you see memory TV, you'll see Yechia Sinwar calling for people, do whatever you can, take axes in your hand, take knives in your hand, take stones, bottles, Molotovs, Kill Jews, kill Jews, get this every single day. This was coming out of Gaza. And this is the rhetoric that's being screwed in Gaza. All right, now take Yehi Sinwar. Now I'm gonna bring the imaginary part. Up to now is real. Now the imaginary part. Imagine that Yehi Sinwar, he has a daughter. And daughter's name is Amara. Amara, nice name of a nice Arab girl. And Amara, she's beautiful and she's modest and she's kind. And she doesn't like killing a mosquito. She thinks it just slaps him. She doesn't like killing a mosquito. And all this talk, it never was all the talk about war and murder for murder's sake and, and this and that and strife and never any peace. It didn't make sense to her. And she thought and thought, thought and thought and thought and thought. And she says she doesn't want to live a militaristic life like the way they live in Gaza. So she took a big chance one night. She went in the middle of the night. She knows her territory. She knows her, her homeland. And she crossed the border, illegally crossed the border. She found a place where the fence, there was a breach in the fence, and she crossed the border. Now, this, I can't tell you how risky that was, because if the Hamas guards would have caught her, they'd have killed her. And if the Israelis, she didn't know what the Israelis were going to do. They see someone infiltrating, that maybe they'll shoot first and ask questions later. But... Uh, she was barefoot and barely had clothes on her back. She couldn't take anything out of the house because they noticed that she was going somewhere. But she went casually, like she was going to a girlfriend or something in the early evening, and she just never came back. And before they started looking for her, she, in the darkness of night, she crossed the border. She made it into Israel. Well, she was right away picked up by an Israeli border patrol. They saw that it was a girl, and she was barefoot and unarmed. And they turned her over to the Shin Beit, Shin Beit is the internal security, and they questioned her, and they saw she was sincere. And she says she was sincere. I believe, she said, I believe in, in the Torah, and I've already been following the Noahide mitzvahs, and I don't believe in murder, and I don't believe that it's against the Noahide mitzvahs. And, I, and she says, I want, to, I want to learn more. So the Shin Beit turned her over to Yad Lachim. Yad Lachim is an organization in Israel. They do wonderful work. This is real. This is real. Yad Achim, uh, what they do, there are sometimes unwitting Israeli girls. They marry Arab guys, and when they end up in the village, they get beaten, they get treated, mistreated. You know, they, they're wined and dined before marriage. But once they're married and take it back to the to Arab village, he's like, we meet students in university, student university. Once he gets in his own village, he turns back to being what, what he is. He's not so polite anymore. And there are a thousand of these girls. So they're used to rec rescuing these girls from Arab villages and they bring them and they, they change their identity because uh, if, if they're caught, then they're, they're in big trouble. They're caught by their old families. And sometimes these are even, and not just in uh, Judea and Samaria villages, but in West Bank, in, in Israeli Arab villages. Okay. And this same organization, this wonderful organization, Yad Lachim, they take Amara and they teach her. She's so sincere. And she goes into this seminar for uh, for converts, 
and she, she loves it. She's fantastic. And she becomes, she learns so quickly. She's got a thirst. Her soul has a thirst. And, and she converts and nobody, nobody knows that she, she's not, she's not Israeli Jewish from birth. Well, she is loved by everybody. She's loved by everybody. But meanwhile, and this is back to the fictitious part. I'm reminding you, this is fictitious. Uh, Reb Chaim Kinevsky, he's no longer with us. He was the great of this generation. But in our story, he's still alive. And Reb Chaim Kinevsky is 92 years old. He's the greatest Torah scholar alive. And he's called the Torah leader of the whole world. And Reb Chaim Kinevsky, he's a widower. And they, they, they decide that Amara, and she changes her name to Amira, which is a Hebrew name. And they take Amira, and she becomes the cleaning girl in Reb Chaim Kinevsky's house. So Reb Chaim Kinevsky is 92, and she's 32, okay? And he sees what a wonderful correct character she has, and what good, that, that careful she is in, in, in every mitzvah, and how she prays, and when she has a few minutes, she says psalms, and you never see anyone like this. So, I think I'm gonna fall on my head, but Reb Chaim Kinevsky marries her. He's 92 and she's 32. Okay, sounds strange. Well, the zealots in the Torah world, they go crazy. What? Reb Chaim Kinevsky is marrying the daughter of the head of Hamas? What is going on here? And then they said, Reb Chaim, maybe he's going to become senile, lost his head, this and that. No, but Reb Chaim Kinevsky doesn't listen to anybody. He doesn't listen to anybody. And they, 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 they take him to religious court and they say, this is a defamation, defamation of Hashem's name. And it's uh, the religious court, the most important one in Israel, the, the, the son of uh, Rav Vosner, Rav Vosner's son, Peter Levy. And no, the religious court says it's okay, but perfectly legal marriage, no, no, no problem with it. She's a, a God fearing young girl. Okay. And then out of this marriage, the day after the wedding, Rav Chaim Kinevsky dies. And Amira, she gives birth to a baby that becomes Mashiach. Uh, does anybody know the background theme of Twilight Zone? Are you, are you humming Twilight Zone while I'm telling the story? <laughs> Beloved brothers, this is this exact story of the Book of Ruth. This is the exact story of the Book of Ruth. It sounds so crazy. We tell it in modern day thing. Boaz was the Rebbe Chaim Kanevsky of his generation. Ruth was the daughter of Eglon, the king of Moab, Israel's arch enemy. Okay. And, and her sister, her sister was Orpa, Ruth and Orpa. And Orpa became the grandmother of Goliath. Goliath. Ruth became the grand grandmother of the great grandmother of David. David and Goliath had the same. Their, their, their grand, their great grandmothers were sisters. Okay. Can you imagine? Goliath's great great grandmother was david's great great aunt and david's great great grandmother ruth was goliath's great great aunt and if anybody runs to hollywood forget about hollywood the torah there's so much more action in the torah if someone learns torah like it is if i tell the whole story of the book of ruth two years ago i told the whole story of the book of ruth in a series in uh miami and it took six hours it was six hours i think it was overtime every every lesson we have somewhere between six and nine hours okay so we don't have that time now but what happens is like this we happen we mentioned our, our new book divine direction which talks about hashkocha pratis and divine direction the book of ruth what we call in hebrew megillat ruth the book of ruth is a story of divine direction hashkocha pratis if we think we run the world look what hashem does Okay, let's do a quick review of the story where we see Hashem's hand guiding and directing the world. Okay, at that time, Boaz, he was the judge. You read about Boaz in the book of Judges. Judge, Boaz was the judge of his generation. Okay, uh, Boaz is the 10th generation great-grandson of Judah. Judah, the son of Jacob, tribe of Judah. Out of tribe of Judah, comes Mashiach, and Mashiach comes, is the descendant of Boaz, of Boaz and Ruth, okay? It's the fast forward, we're going to keep everything in its proper perspective. Okay, Boaz had a brother named Elimelech, uh, first cousin, first cousin. 
Boaz and Elimelech had the same grandfather, had this, the same grandfather. And what at Boaz, there was a terrible time of famine and poverty in the land of Israel. There was poverty because uh, the Jews, they were not behaving themselves at the time. And eventually, at, after Ruth came back, after Ruth came back, there, were, there was the, the poverty could put, turned around, the famine turned around, and became a, a years of abundance. Okay, so Elimelech was married to his first cousin, Naomi, and they were very rich. They lived in, in Bethlehem. Bethlehem in Hebrew is called Beit Lechem Yehuda because it's then part of the tribal land of, of Judah, Beit Lechem Yehuda. And Bethlehem, right there in Bethlehem, where now the the town of uh, uh, the town of Bet El is, is right near there, and uh, the town of Ephrat. Ephrat is right away where a lot of a lot of uh, American English people come. They live in Ephrat. Uh, Ephrat is right near Bethlehem. That's where Ephrat is today, and that's why David was called an Ephrati because Ephrat that was one of the families, one of the clans and tribe of Judah. That David was part of that clan, and. These are the hills that David roamed as a boy. Okay, so going back to his great grandparents, at the time of Boaz, there was a big famine. Elimelech was very rich, and there were all these poor people. And as the Megillah starts, it tells about the other people, the, the gleaning wood in, in Halacha. You have to leave part a tenth of your field. It's called a peah, a tenth of your field that you don't pick it. You leave it for the poor people. And when a farmer is harvesting his wheat and wheat falls on the ground, you don't pick up the wheat that falls on the ground, you leave it for the poor people to glean. They're allowed to glean. And so the poor people come in the field. And this, the McGillis Ruth discusses and talks about the poverty that there was in the land of Israel at that time and, and all the poor people. Well, Elimelech, he didn't want all these poor people knocking on his door every night and asking for a handout. So Elimelech decided that he'd avoid the poor people and the economic situation right across the border in Moab, Moab is today central Jordan, okay, right across the border was just fine. So he took his wife, Naomi, uh, and he took his two sons, Mahlon and Kilion, and they went over the border and they went and lived in Jordan. Well, in Jordan, which was in Moab. Uh, in Yiddish, there's an expression, the mensch tracht an the Ebersh telach, that a person thinks but God laughs, laughs at your thoughts. He makes all kinds of plans, but they laugh. Okay, Elimelech thought he would escape the poor people, but what happened, he escaped life. Life escaped him. He died very shortly after they moved. Okay, once he died, no means of income. No became poor very, very fast, very, very fast. And then what happened? Kilion and Mahlon, when Elimelech was still alive, Elimelech was the son of king. He was the son of the tribe of Judah. And so what they did, they went out also with girls, non-Jewish girls, that they were also they, Ruth and Orpah. They were the two sisters, the daughter of the king. And they married these two sisters. They intermarried and assimilated. Kilion Machlon, okay. Hashem says, guys, you want to assimilate? That's fine. You left Israel? That's fine. You want to leave Judaism? That's fine. You're going to leave life too. They said, bye-bye. They right away. So Naomi, she lost her husband and she lost her first son. She lost her second son. And she's left with her two daughters-in-laws, her two widowed daughters-in-laws, Ruth and Orpah. Okay. Now look what happens, the exact opposite. You see the juxtaposition in the book of Ruth. No Hollywood writer could, could think of this. Okay. If you could think uh, Naomi at back, back home in Beit Lechem, in Bethlehem, she was a Melania Trump. She was a rich woman with a mansion and servants and everything. And in Moab, she became a barefoot beggar, penniless. She didn't have a penny on her name. Okay. Uh, so her sons, they marry out and then life leaves them. They leave Hashem, life leaves them. Okay. So you see the free choice, the juxtaposition. And we see Ruth and Orpah. So what happens? Uh, Naomi says, I have nothing left here. I'd rather be poor back home than be poor in a strange land. So she says uh, to her daughters-in-law, she says, girls, you're, you're young girls. You get married again. Uh, go, go back to your home. Go back to the palace. Go back. Don't, don't, don't be like that. So Orpah, she sheds three tears. And she right away 
goes back. And the time Orpa, she was living a, a kind of constricted life being Nomi's daughter-in-law. The Midrash tells us, okay, hope we don't have anybody under the age of 18 with us watching, but the Midrash tells us that uh, Orpa right away at the palace, she went back to, she went back to Moab and they threw a big party for her and there were a thousand Moabites. And from her party with a thousand Moabites, out of that came Goliath. That's the circumstances of Goliath's birth. And Goliath was this big, tremendous giant. Okay. Naomi says to Ruth, go back, go, 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 go with your sister. Go back to your sister. Okay. Ruth says, no, I'm going to cling to you. I'm going to cling to you and I'm going to cling to your God. I don't want any part of this. And she says, no, you don't understand. It's, it's, it's too difficult. It's there. there there's poverty and and you know it's difficult to be a to be a Jew. Look at the enemies. Look at the, look what your own people think of us. And said, no, no, no. She says, "Where you go, I go. Your God is my God. Where you sleep, I sleep." She clings to her. She clings to her mother-in-law. So we see a juxtaposition of Ruth and Orpah. This is a future juxtaposition. What we see with David and Goliath. Okay. So Ruth does the opposite of Orpah and Elimelech. Ruth actually does, if we were teaching according to Kabbalah, she does a soul correction of, uh, of Elimelech. And what it really is, out, where did Moab come? Ammon and Moab, they are the descendants of Lot. Lot was from Abram's family. And the circumstances of their birth was very risque. It was an uh, incestual, they were in a cave with their father when Sodom and Gomorrah were, were destroyed. And they thought that the whole world was destroyed and they thought there was nobody else to populate the world. So they gave their father, his, his two daughters, they gave their father wine to drink, got him questionably drunk and they had an incestual relationship. From the incestual relationship, Ammon, the Moab were born. Ammon, with Ammon Jordan, you know what Ammon means? Okay, Ammon is it, it, it's from, from my nation. I come from my own nation. Moab means Moab, it means I come from my father. In other words, it, it's, it's the mother saying, my son comes from my father. And this is in session that was did. If, if it weren't in the Torah, we could say it. If it weren't in the Torah, but this is, it's so risque. And we'll see, this is all the secret of Mashiach. Look at these. These, these kind of stories would be X-rated. We wouldn't tell them. But it's, it's not in Torah. We're teaching Torah. But this is the evil inclinations fight to avoid bringing Mashiach. And this is the secret of Mashiach. The evil inclination knows that once Mashiach comes, his time, that, that's finished. It's finished. But, and he goes up there to Hashem. He says, Hashem, what are you going to bring Mashiach? And, and they're going to redeem the Jewish people. And Mashiach is going to bring peace on earth. And Mashiach is going to advertise your name on earth. And, and what we say in Elaine of Achobene and all of living flesh is going to throw away their idolatry and call your name. Come on, Hashem, that can't happen. That can't happen. Shem says, okay, don't worry. Evil inclination is an angel. Don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, it, it's not, not going to happen. It, you won't mind. So he sees things like this, ancestral relationships. That doesn't bother evil inclination. He's happy with that. Okay, the more the merrier. Look at the situation, the circumstance of David's great-grandfather and Boaz's 10-generation grandfather, Judah. Judah has three sons and two sons are killed for spilling their seed, what the Torah teaches, that uh, uh, not allowed to do that outside the context of a commandment of Torah, which is two commandments of Torah, one for procreation and the second for marital gratification. The marriage has to be happy and that's one of the ways. Okay, but outside of marriage and outside of procreation, procreation within marriage, that you can't, not with strange people, not with that. That's, that, that's, in, that's in the Ten Commandments. It's in the Ten Commandments. So what happens? Judah, by right, had, did not let his son do a liberate marriage with Tamar, she, according to Halacha, if her husband dies and she doesn't have children, her husband's brother has to take her. Judah wouldn't let it. He said, no, no, that she's already killed two of my sons. Uh, no more. So Judah had the, uh, had the obligation. He didn't do it. So what did Tamar do? 
Tamar, and this is King David's great, great, great grandmother. Look what Hashem has to do to bring Mashiach. We're talking about a, a, a highly, highly R-rated, if not X-rated flick on, on Hollywood. Okay, Tamar, she dresses up, she takes off her mourning clothes, her black clothes, because she's a widow. And widow back then in Israel had to wear black. You can still see this in, in, in Spain. You still see this in some Mediterranean countries in Italy that uh, widows wore black. Okay, back in ancient Israel, they used to do that too. So she takes off her mourning clothes and she puts on her discotheque clothes. She puts on her discotheque clothes and she knows that Judah is coming to the south of Israel. To, it's, come, it's, it's, it's shearing time for the sheep. And she finds out exactly where he's going to be. And he's been a long time without a wife, and she is really enticing. And she stands on a crossroads like a woman of the night would do. Okay. Well, Judah was a holy guy. Hashem gave him such an evil inclination. Hashem said to evil inclination, evil inclination, do your deal. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah, Hashem, you could test him. Let's test him. He's a real tzaddik. The evil inclination, Hashem gave him license to entice Judah in the worst possible way. I mean, you're talking about, if you can imagine, the most beautiful woman in the world, I don't know who, who that would be, and then multiply it a couple of times and imagine a man with an urge for this woman and multiply that a couple of times. That is what the evil inclination put into Judah. Okay, so he says to, uh, he says to the young lady, name your price. And she says, uh, you know, she gives him some price. He says, uh, I don't have that kind of money in my pocket. So what does she do? She says, okay, give me your signet ring and give me your, your rod, his walking stick, and uh, give me your cloak for, for uh, collateral, okay? Give me collateral and then you bring the money and then, okay, I'll answer your request right now. So fine, he gave her signet ring, gave her rod, things that identify him, this personal thing. A man's signet ring, they didn't have signature back then. They you took your signet ring and wax and you signed your name. Boom, you punch the, the punch the parchment and that's how you sign your name. Well, she had his signet ring and she had, he had his possessions. She had his walking stick. Okay. And out of that relationship came twins, Zerach and Peretz. Okay, but meanwhile, Judah thinks he spent the evening with the hooker. And when he right away uh, he sent back, uh, sent his uh, Adulami, sent his, his servant to with, with the payment for, payment was his prime lamb best from the, from the flock. Okay, he says, bring me back the collateral and give her the lamb. And he says, boss, I didn't see any hooker in a crossroads. There's nobody there. He says, what? She was right there. She said she waved her payment. No, right there. She disappeared. Okay, well, he thinks he spent the night with the hooker. But meanwhile, the daughter-in-law, three months go by, and the daughter-in-law's belly starts to bulge. And they say, what? And they say, Judah, guess what? Mm -hmm. Your daughter-in-law has been playing around. That's against halacha. She's not allowed to do that. And she's the daughter of a priest. She's the daughter of Abimelech, high priest. And Judah was a religious court judge also. And he says, what do you have to do? What's the, what's the law? What's the law? What do you do? He says, she gets burned. She gets burnt at stake. So they take Tamar out to be burned. And right before she burns, she allowed her one last request. And she says, a signet ring and the rod and the cloak. And she says, give this to Judah and ask him if he recognizes it. Okay. This is one of the key points. The Gemara talks about that. This is the key point of a leader, a true leader. This was so embarrassing. Can you imagine how many leaders, politicians would deny it? Oh no, was it, they, they, they deny it? No, he didn't deny it. He says, I'm not gonna kill. He knew when the Holy Spirit, she had twins. I'm not gonna kill three souls. And uh, she says, no, recognize this. So he recognized it, okay. And then he married her and then she born. And this is the circumstances of King David. Look what Hashem has to do to outsmart the evil inclination, to bring Mashiach. And now they come down here and, and we're in this, I told you the story about the daughter of the head of the Hamas and Rabbi Kanevsky. That is really nothing compared to Boaz and the daughter of the king of Moab. And it's right here. So if you go back, go even further, what Laban had to 
They tried to kill Jacob. What Jacob had to do to get Judah. Jacob had to marry two sisters and, you know, the circumstance of marrying, uh, he wanted to marry Rachel, but Laban gave him, uh, gave him Leah. Instead, he had to work another seven years for Rachel and blah, blah, all this thing. This is all to prevent Mashiach. Look about all to prevent Mashiach. And so then we have Judah and Tamar in order to get parrots, which David granted. And then we have Boaz and Ruth in order to get David. And David, we're going to talk about King David. The resistance to King David. Do you know how King David was born? I tell you, it's all, I'm, I'm, I'm almost blushing. Because hey, this is uh, tonight's, what I should have rated tonight is uh, X rated. Okay, if there's any anybody under the age of 18, under the, in what they call juvenile age, please let them leave the screen. That's all. Okay, only this is adult listening only, this adult Torah. And these are things they don't even explain in, in the high schools, in, in, in the Hasidic high schools, because they don't know how to explain them, how to explain them to the girls, because we don't teach our kids anything about they, Their kids are very innocent until right before the wedding, they learned what the wedding is all about. And that this is it really, really go, our, our children go up very pure. What happens with King David? There was an argument all through. And the whole reason that Samuel the prophet codified the book of Ruth is because the Torah forbids a Moabite and an Ammonite for coming into the Jewish people. Why? They were, uh, they had a terrible trait that they were ingrates. They were unbelievable ingrates. Even though Abraham saved Lot from a certain death twice, Lot's offspring tried to kill Abraham's offspring. Not only did they not say thank you that your grandfather saved our grandfather, if not, we wouldn't have been born, but they tried to kill him. And this is a terrible, terrible ingratitude, terrible ingratitude. And this one thing that uh, it's a Nazi that killed Jews can be accepted as a convert. In fact, the Gemara says that there are sons of Haman, grandsons of Haman learning Torah in, in, uh, in B'nai Brak. Let's say Gemara tractate Megillah. And Haman wanted to annihilate the Jewish people. And Hitler was a uh, was a, a descendant of Haman, okay, from the house of Esau. And here, I'm the Moab. They didn't kill Jews, but we don't want them in, in ten generations. Torah doesn't doesn't allow that because of the, such ingrate and ingrate. The whole world the word for Jew is Yehudi. It means to thank, thank you. Then the, 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 the word Jew means to give thanks. And we have to say thank you, thank you to Hashem, thank you to our fellow human, thank you to everyone. If you want to see a person that is really observant of Torah law, it's a person that's all the time saying thank you. It's a person that's appreciative. This is, this is the basis. So uh, Samuel the prophet, he wrote this to explain what his religious court, when he was prophet of Israel, that we don't allow Ammonites and Moabites to become converts, but we do allow Ammonites and Moabites. The females, yes, because the females weren't like the males. Now, one thing I want to clarify, when Sennacherib overran the land of Israel and the Babylonian conquest, the destruction of the first temple, that the tribes were dispersed and the nations were dispersed and they brought in foreigners and Ammon and Moab and the land of Israel. The ancient, the ancient Egypt, Egypt today is not the ancient Egyptians. The Jordanians today are now the Ammonites and Moabites. So this, in effect, is a little bit theoretical because we don't know who the Ammonites and the Moabites are. But this is what Boaz knew, that he could marry a Moabitess convert. In Boaz's generation, he had resistance, and again, the evil inclination, it was Doeg, and Doeg and had his own revolutionary religious court that he objected to Boaz. And Doeg even tried to kill King David later. <laughs> this is a, it's a bad news, people. And Doeg said all types of slander about Boaz that he married. Uh, he married a woman who was a Jewish. And this is I'm from, for many for a pre president of Israel and then the judge of Israel. Okay. But we see the power of the land of Israel in the book of Ruth, and this is why Mashiach, people think that Mashiach is going to come in London. He won't be there. Uh, I look forward to coming to Mexico City, but Mashiach won't be coming to Mexico City. 
when he comes, he's going to come to Jerusalem. Okay. And uh, David, get everybody ready to come to Jerusalem. And uh, David, London, everybody come to it. Okay. We're, we're visiting there, but Moshiach comes. We're all going to be running back. That's the power of, of Eretz Yisrael, the power of land of Israel. Mashiach will only be here. Okay. So the, even though Elimelech was a descendant of Nachshon, who was a descendant of Judah, and Nachshon was a great hero. Remember the splitting of the Red Sea. Nachshon was the first one to jump in the Red Sea. Hashem did not split the Red Sea until Nachshon took the initiative. As soon as he could swim, he grew up in the desert. As soon as he threw himself in the Red Sea, then Hashem split the Red Sea. Okay, this is what Hashem, we learned dedication from this. But even though Elimelech was a great grandson of Nachshon, this was not enough to protect him. When he left the land of Israel, he lost the protection. Now, it's the difference between a person that never been in the land of Israel and a person that comes to the land of Israel or was born in the land of Israel, grew up in the land of Israel, and forsakes the land of Israel. Everybody outside, nobody ever forsake the land of Israel. You're just born in the UK. You're born in Mexico. You're born in the US. You're born in Canada. You're born in South Africa. You're born wherever you are, but you didn't forsake. A person that forsakes the land of Israel, that is bad news. That is already bad news. And that's why... Uh, and that's why it was such big trouble. So we see that all this odyssey, that Hashem has to circumvent the evil inclination in order to bring Mashiach. And we see this right now. You can see this right now in modern Israel. Everything, if people look at what's happening with Amuna eyes, you see the government of Israel right now. People don't see what's going to solve the story of Mashiach. The government of Israel right now. Today, can you imagine today, and, and if, you know, I don't put politics, I talk Mashiach. I'm, we're looking at current events with the, with the eyes of politics. This morning, the Shura Council, the Shura Council is the council of the Muslim clerics, what they decide what the Arab members of Knesset, they, they should do. They go and they consult them. Naftali Bennett, who's the prime minister, uh, he was given advice several years ago by Rabbi Chaim Druckmann. Rabbi Chaim Druckmann is the number one scholar of the National Religious Rabbis. He's a big tzaddik, tremendous tzaddik. And Rabbi Druckmann wanted Naftali Bennett to do something that was against Naftali Bennett's liking. And Naftali Bennett says, no rabbi is going to tell me what to do. Okay, Mr. Naftali Bennett has to live another 10 lifetimes to know the Torah that Rabbi Chaim Druckmann has, that Rabbi Chaim Druckmann is a, he's a tzaddik and he's such, he's so, so humble and he's, he's in his nine, he's wonderful, wonderful one. He loves, he loves every person. He loves the land of Israel. He loves Torah. It's off the chart scholar. Okay, so what does Shem do? Okay, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Prime Minister, you don't want to listen to the, the, the spiritual leaders of Israel. You listen to the spiritual leaders of Moab. So today, they decided they were, they were, they would, if they, they, whether the Arabs would leave the coalition or not, because the whole coalition depends on the Arabs. It's the first coalition in the Israeli government ever that is depend on the Arabs. There's not a Jewish majority in the government. The government has a Jewish minority. Okay. And the Jewish minority, they got the majority by taking, you know, paying all kinds of, of money to Arabs. This is the same thing as, as Elimelech going, Elimelech didn't want to listen to, to Boaz, didn't want to stay in the land of Israel. Okay, he ended up. Uh, his daughters married the king of the, the king of Moab. It does about act opposite. The person thinks he runs the world. Exact opposite. Hashem laughs at him. Hashem laughs at him. So we see a couple of key lessons in the Book of Ruth. Not only bringing Mashiach, we see the importance and the power of land of Israel and the blessing of land of Israel. And we see the importance and blessing of listening to our spiritual guides. What did Ruth do? Ruth could say, I'm the daughter of a king. I know what I'm doing. I don't have to listen to anybody. She put her intellect aside. Ruth, how did she merit becoming the great grandmother, a Moabitess convert? And she, people don't realize this. People sometimes turn their nose up at righteous converts. I hate that. I can't stand that. Okay. that. <laughs> and they, she becomes the great grandmother of Mashiach, not some... Um, High flighty flute and Rebitson or something like that. I'll convert because her emuna was so unbelievable. And what she did, she said to Naomi, she completely subjugated herself to Naomi. Wherever you go, I'm going to go. Wherever you sleep, you sleep. Your nation is my nation. Your God is my God. 
completely as if she knew nothing. Ah, Shem says, young lady, you are so humble that you know nothing and you throw yourself at the feet of a righteous woman. Naomi, she had listed her husband. She never wanted to leave Israel. Okay, Naomi was a very, very righteous woman. Okay, we talked about names a few weeks ago and Naomi is a, a nice name to give a girl because Naomi means pleasant from Naima, Nama, Naomi. Okay, but Ruth listened to her completely. And look, this is what Ruth married. She became the grandmother of the Shiach. So we also learn the equal right to Torah. And all the time, tell people at the righteous conference, they tell Noahides. The Gemara says about a Noahide, a Noahide that learns Torah is on the level of a high priest. A Noahide that is careful about performing his or her commandments, the Noahide commandment, the level of high priest. And it's not my words, the words of Rebbe Meir Balanes. Rebbe Meir Balanes is your site, is, is this coming Sunday? And that was, uh, that's also my birthday. I was born in your site. Rebbe Meir Balanes was one of the great five scholars, the teachers of, of uh, the great five, the students of Rebbe Akiva. After Rebbe Akiva's 24,000 students died because they didn't respect one another, that's in this time of year in the Omer. Rebbe Akiva didn't throw up his hands and give it all up. Rebbe Akiva started all over again with five students. And his five students became the greatest five scholars of Torah. One was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who went Lag Ba Omer. We go to Moran. That, that's his. Uh, that's his Yerusha. One Rabbi Meir Balanes, one uh, Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Yehuda Bar Eli, and Rosi ben, Rabbi Yosi Ben Chalafta. Okay, so start again. So, what the lessons we learned from the Book of Ruth are the power of the land of Israel, and the holiness of the land of Israel. And you don't want if you're there, you don't want to leave. Okay. The second is that the poor have equal right to Torah. We're not only talking about the monetarily poor, the physically poor, we're talking about the spiritually poor, that a person that grew up in a family with no spirituality, grew up in a family that never knew anything about Torah, never learned anything about Torah. Okay. And I learned, and don't say, don't let anybody get down you because you're no high to righteous comfort. <laughs> righteous comfort is the great grandmother of Mashiach. Hey, so your kids can go a long way. It depends what you want. It depends on your amuna. It depends on your choices. Okay. And there's another thing. We learn in the book of Ruth, we mention the laws of charity, letting the poor people glean on the field. Since we don't have fields, we give a tithe. We give a tithe. Many people give what's called a homish. It's a fifth, a fifth of their income. Uh, Rabbi Nachman talks about the power of giving a fifth of income. Okay. But we give a good portion of our income to poor people. The poor people and if we have a field then we leave a part of a field fallow that the poor people can come in and this is the importance of that and another thing the other reason that why we read the book of ruth on the six of sivan on shavuot that this is the day king david was born and this is the day king david died this is your site mentioned king david talking about the secret of mashiach king david didn't finish the story go back and finish the story uh, King David's father didn't know which religious court to believe, to believe Boaz, his father's, his name was Jesse, or to believe Doeg. Doeg is very convincing. We should have known to put aside Boaz, but to put aside Jesse and, and listen to Boaz. But Boaz told him that his marriage to, his marriage was fine. Okay. And Boaz says, no, you've got a problem. You are not really Jewish because your great grandmother was not really Jewish. So he says, wait a second. If Doeg is right, then I'm improperly married to my wife. Okay. And if Boaz is right, I am, but who knows? So he didn't know what he was going to do. So he thought he was doing his wife a favor and he gave her a divorce. This is after he already had seven sons from her. After he gave her a divorce, or excuse me, I got it wrong. He didn't give her a divorce. He took her concubine as a wife. And he says, okay, if, if Doig is right, then it's okay. I can be married to a concubine. But he didn't give her a divorce. Took the concubine. Well, the concubine was very loyal to King David's mother, to Jesse's wife. And when they were supposed to have the wedding ceremony, she did a switch. And after the wedding when they went into the tent it was like rachel and leah it wasn't the concubine that went into the tent with jesse 
it was his wife. So from that night, King David was conceived, but Jesse thought he was with a concubine. So then after a couple of months later, and he saw his first wife's belly protrude, he said, what's that? He hadn't been with her in several months. He says, what's that? And so he consulted his sons. They were already older already. And they said, uh, daddy, we better not say anything because this is family names. Can correct the family name. And um, they're prestigious. They're also descendants of, of Judah, the tribe of Judah, and very prestigious family. No, we better not say a word. Okay, so <laughs> I thought, what are you going to do? When King David was born, he grew up an outcast. Nobody wanted him. His brothers hated him. His father hated him. His mother knew who he was. She raised him. But when he was three years old, Jesse threw him out in the desert so the lion or a bear would eat him. Back then, there were lions and bears in the desert. And that's why we learn in the Midrash that King David learned very young, self-preservation, thank you, Shem took care of him, to learn a slingshot and be very active with a slingshot. And age three, he killed a lion and a bear. Can you imagine a three-year-old? It brings tears to my eyes just to think about it. Think of a fear of a three-year-old being alone in the Judean desert. If you've ever been in the Judean desert at night, hmm, and especially on a maneuver by yourself, it is jittery. You hear the coyotes, of the, well, the jackals. Ah, it's really, really weird. And you hear these voices in the night, and there, there's, there's uh, uh, Judean mountain lions out there. They still are. They're, they're, they're small. They're about the size of a cougar, not the size of an African lion. But uh, you hear this roaring at night. You hear these the sounds of the night. It is very, very jittery. <laughs> very jittery. We're on a, some kind of navigational maneuver in, in the Judean desert at night. You feel a lot better when you're with somebody else. Imagine a three-year-old out in the field with all these wolves and, 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 and wild animals. And psh, this is what King David went through. What King David had to go through to become king of Israel, and this is Mashiach is trying to kill him every single moment. King David, the great-grandson of, of Ruth. Okay, Ruth and, and Ruth, when she gave birth to, when she gave birth to, uh, to Ovid, Ovid to Jesse and Jesse to David, she let Nomi raise him. She said, better you should raise him. Nomi educated him. So she was like, uh, she, she gave the physical birth and then turned him over to Nomi, got Nomi's education. King David, he, his, his own father denied him. That's why King David writes in, in, in Psalm 27, Ki omi ve You ever read in Psalm 27? We read this all the month of Elul. That, what is King David talking about? He says, when my mother and my father forsake me and Hashem gathered me up. <laughs> King David, he had, one that was his father in heaven. His father in heaven was everything for him. I think, what, what do you think King David, to write the most famous Psalm in the world, Psalm 23, Though I walk in the valley of death, I shall not fear you not with me. King David felt this on his flesh since he was three years old. Can you imagine a 12-year-old before his bar mitzvah? Okay. And they put him in a ring. Okay. You put him in a ring. And who's he up against? 12-year-old. A 12-year-old may be soaking wet. He weighs 120, 125 kilo. How many is that in stone, David, real quick? <laughs> okay, who knows? Okay, I don't know, but he weighs, uh, sop and wet, he weighs 60 kilos, 55 kilos. And he's got this eight foot tall giant that weighs 300 kilos without an ounce of fat on him, armored to the hilt from head to toe. And you're going to find him. Uh, what? 12-year-old would not have a cardiac arrest on the spot. And Goliath comes and he blasphemes Hashem. Heaven forbid, heaven forbid, he curses Hashem's name. And he looks him in the eye with no fear. This is a child that's been looking lions and bears in the eyes for three years, for, since he was three years old. And he says, you knave, you scoundrel, you curse the holy name. I come with that holy name. That's what I'm coming to you. You come with your sword. You come with your armor. I come with the holy name. 
And that's when Goliath lifted up his sword. King David took one of his rocks, boom, right between the eyes. And the rest is history. King David, oh, the story's not over. King David's father-in-law, imagine, okay, your father-in-law doesn't like you, but your father-in-law hires an army to chase you and try and kill you. King Saul, he chased David all. He was jealous of King David, his son-in-law, because King David was very popular. King Saul tried to kill him. Uh, Saul, Saul's daughter, Michal, she revolted against her husband. King David had not one son, had two sons revolt against him. Okay, I mean, Noam and, and Ab Absalom, they, they both revolted against him. His close advisor revolted against him. You go one by one, he had enemies within, enemies without. And what does King David do? He cries, Hashem, my life is so hard. He writes the book of Psalms. That is the forerunner of Mashiach. That's why Mashiach comes from King David. So we look at what's happening to us, Jewish people. And what? Hashem, somebody said to me not long ago, uh, where was Hashem in the Holocaust? And I said, wait a second. It, 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 it seems to me, I, I know you personally, this personal individual. I said, since I've known you, you've been doing everything to run away from Hashem. And now you're talking about where's Hashem? <laughs> you want to be Hashem? King David did everything to run to Hashem, be close to Hashem. King David says in Psalm 51, Hashem, I don't care what you do to me. Just don't ever leave me. I'll touch the this is the secret of Mashiach. The secret of Mashiach is Emuna. And Emuna bringing in this is this why King David became the forerunner of Mashiach, because he had more Emuna than anyone else. He writes in Psalm 119, call mitzvah Emuna. Talk about King David's Emuna. We could do a whole separate lesson on King David Emuna. But King David is oh, by far, by far, that 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 that's my hero. That's very nice. He's the the father of Muna, the the bull, the or even though they say Abraham is the father of Muna. It all starts from Abraham. But King David lived every single difficulty that a human being can imagine, and then more, and then more. So if we see now, we don't know what's happening in the world, and we see here in Israel, it's a crazy, crazy government. We see it in Europe and America, things against the Torah or political correctness. And, and Torah, people, the, people that, that follow Torah, they're casting it, I get, the people have a rough time. They have a rough time. This is all part of Mashiach. Put a smile on your face, read divine direction, and cling to Hashem. Because there's nothing else in this world but Hashem. Ain't old milvado. There's nothing but Him. And as we devoted our little book, Three Words of Amuna, that there's nothing but Hashem. And there's nothing else. And if a person thinks that there's apple pie, comes a time that apple pie, the whole world is running apple pie, he ends up getting diabetes and he can't eat apple pie anymore. As soon as we put our desire, uh, Rabbi Nachman says about money, many people look for money. Rabbi Nachman says one of two things happen to money. You know what happens to money? Either Hashem takes the person away from the money or Hashem takes the money away from the person, but they don't go together. That's why in a shroud, there's an expression in Yiddish, in a shroud, a shroud is a burial garment, and they're made out of flax, according to Allah, white flax, simple white flax. There's no pockets in a shroud. Why are there no pockets? Because whatever person accumulates in this world, not going to take the next world. The only thing we take to the next world is our Torah, our good deeds, and our amuna. That is the currency of the next world. And Bo Hashem, cherish brothers and sisters, I wish you a wonderful, meaningful Shavuot. And I look forward to seeing you when we get back see you very soon. And you should have success in everything you do. Big blessings. And we should see the light of Mashiach with our own eyes very quickly. Amen.